dear viewers today i in intend to talk to you about the composition and jurisdiction of the supreme court of india which is the highest judicial organ in the indian constitutional setup it is also referred to as the apex court the according to the article 124 of the indian constitution the supreme court consists of a chief justice and seven other judges the parliament of india has been given the power to increase the number of judges accordingly the parliament subsequently progressively increase the number of judges at the moment the supreme court consists of a chief justice and 30 other judges these judges including the chief justice as i already referred to in my previous lecture are appointed by the president in terms of article 124 clause 2 the this article was not amended but the pattern of the procedure for appointment of the supreme court as well as high court judges were significantly changed particularly after 1993 how and why was discussed in my previous lecture while considering the appointment of the high court judges so i needn't elaborate this point further here i i just want to point out one thing that in this appointment process the judiciary particularly the chief justice and four senior most judges of the supreme court have given have been given prominence in the selection of judges of the supreme court and high courts and this was criti criticized in different quarters hence the necessity was felt for the constitution of a for the composition of a judicial commission judicial appointment commission accordingly last year a bill was passed in the rajya sabha in september 5 2013 a constitution amendment bill was passed in the rajya sabha the bill was sent to a parliamentary standing committee for critical scrutiny of the bill the bill if passed in the lok sabha subsequently and if the president gives his assent to the bill the bill will become an act after the bill becomes an act the composition of the committee entrusted with the task of selecting the judges will be like this that is this proposed commission will have as its members the chief justice of india two senior most judges of the supreme court the union law minister and two other eminent persons from different walks of life so these six members will appoint judges of the supreme court as well as of the high courts now the question is the other two members eminent members how these eminent members will be selected here also a separate panel has been proposed a separate panel consisting of the prime minister of india the leader of the opposition in the lok sabha and the chief justice of india will decide who will be the other two eminent persons to be the members of the judicial appointment commission so that's all about the proposed commission further i just only want to point out that 
Article 124 Clause 3 deals with the qualification of judges. It says a judge of the Supreme Court must be a citizen of India, must have served five years as a high court judge or must be an advocate of a high court or high courts for about 10 years. Or further, in the opinion of the president, he must be a distinguished jurist. It means he must be an eminent legal expert. So that's all about the <coughs> qualifications and a judge retires, a Supreme Court judge retires at 65, he may be removed earlier on grounds of misbehavior and incapacity already elaborately discussed in my previous lecture. So I needn't repeat that point here. Uh, further, I also discussed in my previous lectures provisions regarding provisions securing the independence of the Supreme Court and High Court judges. There are several provisions, so I needn't repeat those provisions now. So I just want to go straight into the jurisdictions of the Supreme Court now. Before I do that, I must point out one thing at the outset that our Constitution confers the Supreme Court the status of a court of record. And as a court of record, it can punish anybody for contempt of the Supreme Court. Now I pros uh, want to deal with the jurisdictions of the Supreme Court. These are very important. In fact, I must say that our Supreme Court is a multi-jurisdictional body. In fact, our constitution clearly lays down in several articles the jurisdictions of the Supreme Court in several respects. These jurisdictions, according to the Constitution, are fourfold. That means they are, there are four types of jurisdiction. One, original jurisdiction. Two, read jurisdiction. Three, appellate jurisdiction. Four, advisory jurisdiction. All these jurisdictions must be explained separately. Now, first, Original jurisdiction means the authority of a court, in this case the authority of the Supreme Court, to hear a case in the first instance. That means the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court alone will hear certain specific cases. For instance, in this case, the Supreme Court will hear cases of disputes between the federating units. In the sense, as already explained, we have a we are a federation, India is a federation. So there are two sets of government, the central government and the state governments. Naturally, disputes may arise between the central government and the state governments. So this dispute between the central government will be heard by the Supreme Court in its original jurisdiction or there is the possibility of a dispute between the central government and one or more state governments on one side and one or more state governments on the other side. This dispute will also be settled by the Supreme Court in its original jurisdiction. Or there may be disputes between different states themselves. This dispute will also be settled by the Supreme Court in its original jurisdiction. Next, read jurisdiction. I said that a read is a remedy whereby the Supreme Court or High Court enforce our fundamental rights. So if we find that, if we feel that our rights have been taken away, we may complain to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court has at its disposal, different reads like habeas corpus, mandamus, etc. And by using those reads, the Supreme Court will try to protect our fundamental rights. 
So that is called the read jurisdiction. Thirdly, the Supreme Court is the highest court of appeal. So we must analyze the appellate jurisdiction of the Supreme Court by saying at the outset that the Supreme Court is the highest court of appeal. And as the highest court of appeal, the Supreme Court combines in itself various appellate jurisdiction. What are these various appellate jurisdictions? These are laid down from Article 132 to Article 136. First, the Supreme Court has appellate jurisdiction in constitutional matters, two in civil matters, three in criminal matters, and finally, appeal by special leave can be granted by the Supreme Court in its discretion. While analyzing the Supreme Court's jurisdiction, appellate jurisdiction in constitutional matters, it must be pointed out that two con conditions must be fulfilled here. One, the case involves a substantial question of law as to the interpretation of the Constitution. Two, the High Court certifies that the matter has to be decided by the Supreme Court. This is Supreme Court's appellate jurisdiction in constitutional matters. Then the Supreme Court's appellate jurisdiction in civil matters. Similarly, right to appeal to the Supreme Court lies where, where again two conditions are fulfilled. One, the case involves substantial questions of law of general importance. And secondly, the High Court certifies that the matter is required to be decided by the Supreme Court. Then a civil case can be heard on appeal by the Supreme Court. Third, criminal cases, appellate jurisdiction in criminal cases. One, the High Court has on appeal reversed an order of acquittal, meaning that a subordinate court has tried a case and the accused has been found not guilty. So he has been honorably acquitted. In that case, the High Court takes up the case and High Court, after deciding the matter, reverts the earlier verdict and convicted him and passed death sentence. In that case, an appeal can lie to the Supreme Court. Or, for, or again, a trial has started at, in a subordinate court, but the subordinate court couldn't complete the trial. In the meantime, the High Court has taken up the case and High Court passed death sentence against an accused person. In that case also, the matter may be sent to the Supreme Court for appeal. Finally, the High Court itself may certify that a criminal matter may be required to be decided by the Supreme Court itself. In addition to this, the High Supreme Court has the power to grant special leave over any judgment of any court or tribunal in India. This is Supreme Court's discretionary power. So, that is another aspect of appellate jurisdiction, appeal by special leave. Finally, the Supreme Court has advisory jurisdiction. In its advisory jurisdiction, it can be found in Article 143. The Constitution states that the President may seek advice from the Supreme Court regarding any question of law or fact of public importance. The Supreme Court may send the advice to the President as asked for. However, the President is not bound to accept the opinion 
of the Supreme Court in the matter. It must be pointed out also that the Supreme Court is also not bound to give its opinion in a particular matter as asked for. So these are some of the jurisdictions, four jurisdictions of the Supreme Court contained in our constitution. So let me sum up what I have discussed so far. Firstly, I discussed the composition, appointments, strength of the judges, the tenure of the judges, the, their process of removal, and finally, I also discussed the different jurisdictions of the Supreme Court, the original jurisdiction, the read jurisdiction, the appellate jurisdiction, the advisory jurisdiction. If we can understand properly all these jurisdictions, it will then be possible for us to assess the role of the Supreme Court in different spheres. For instance, its role as a federal court, its role as a protector of fundamental rights, its role as the highest court of appeal, its role as the interpreter and custodian of our constitution, which is in fact my, the subject matter of my next lecture. This lecture will be understandable to all if one can properly understand the different jurisdictions contained in different provisions of our constitution. Thank you all.